OK, so now we're going to be looking at political instability in China, and the reason for that is because well, it should be pretty obvious. We've been looking at the relationship Japan has had with China this entire time and how that has played a role in their foreign policies, internal policies and all of that stuff, right? Um, so we're going to be looking at what's going on with China and a lot of this is going to explain some of the things that we looked up earlier um, in our other lectures. So background, um, the fall of the Qing dynasty began in October 10th, 1911. So this is China's dynasty, right? The fall of this dynasty led to a weak, chi a weak Chinese government uh, that was overruled by warlords. I had mentioned that in one of the previous videos and that the reason why Japan was able to implement those 21 demands on China and kind of get some of those things out of out of them was because um, because of this instability that's in China and part of that has to do with the warlord. So each warlord had their own private military and controlled their own region and had set up their own government. Um, and so we can see right here in orange what the Qing dynasty looks like, but just think of like each region within this dynasty, especially up here in Manchuria, as being controlled by a different military leader, a different warlord, um, not a centralized government or state governments or anything like that. None of them took into consideration the government's actual rules and actual government. Um, it was like as if the government was just there to exist just because they had no real power and these warlords just kind of did whatever they wanted to. As mentioned before, Japan's aims um, were to take over the former uh, German colony, colony, um, colony, sorry, that were located in China. Had it not been for the protection of the U.S., it is likely that Japan would have gained these territories and gotten all of their 21 demands. Um, like I said, they did gain some of those 21 demands, but the U.S. kind of came in and was like, nope. And again, not because the U.S. is like, oh, I'm doing this because I really like China and I want to protect them. They're my friend. No, because the U.S. has interests in, within China as well, and they are interested in protecting those interests. Um, <clears throat> China and Japan, 1911 through 22. We're going to see what's going on with them. As mentioned before, the rivalry between and the tension between the two was growing, and this had already existed prior to this, right? So this is just kind of furthering along this rivalry and tension had already existed, and Korea did not help, right? After World War I, Japan did send an ambassador coup to defend them in the negotiations regarding Shandong, and if it and if it would have, and it would be as if it would be to give it to Japan. Sorry, I can't read as stated before. When China found out Japan was going to gain Shandong, this led to people protesting um, Japan, which led to the May 4th movement. Additionally, people began to turn to alternatives to get rid of Western Japanese, Western Japanese influence. So as I had also mentioned in a previous video, this is where we start to see the rise of like a commun the communist movement, the Communist Party of China. Um, the Communist Party, of China grew out of the uh, May 4th movement and we start to see the rise of Mao occurring around this time as well. We'll see if you do authoritarian states or, author you know, in your next unit, uh, Mao China is one of the states that's studied. Um, and I highly recommend you go in that route because it fits very well with this right here. Um, this left China divided as some joining the communist movement while others sided with the right wing nationalists. And we're going to see into that as well. And you will see into that if you go into that authoritarian route um, for the next unit with China. OK, but they did have but what they did have in common, whether they were right wing nationalists in China or communists in China, is that they both hated Japan. So the enemy of my enemy is, you know, type of stuff, right? So. <clears throat> The Guomindang and the Northern Expedition, uh, as mentioned before, China was divided and everyone shared a hatred for Japan. In 1923, the Communist Party of China joined uh, the Guomindang, Guomindang uh, the Nationalist Party, the GMD. So you'll see them either mentioned, and there's different spellings for the Guomindang, right? But this is how the IB book spells it for this version, at least. And then they're also known as the Nationalists and the GMD. So if you're ever, if you see that being mentioned in any of those three names, just know that that's who they are, the right wing, um, nationalist Party, OK? Uh, so the communists and the right wing Nationalist Party put up this thing called a united front. So they're coming together, setting aside their politics and their ideologies and saying, well, we hate the Japanese and we hate the warlords. So we're going to get rid of both of these. So the leaders of the GMD, the leader of the GMD was uh, Jiang Jieshi. Again, there's a different spellings of his names um, depending on what 
part of his life you are in and what version of the book you have as well. He had very strong anti-communist and Japanese um, feelings. Uh, you know, the, as he quoted, the Japanese as a disease of the Japanese as the disease of the skin, but the communists are a disease of the heart. In 1926, he launched an expedition up north to end the rule of the warlords in the area. He began with the Gua uh, Guangdong region. Uh, then Beijing and then Manchuria. In 27, J uh, Jiang Jieshi betrays the communists and launched a campaign against them known as the White Terror to get rid of all the communists. So basically a mass slaughter. Um, like I said, if you study the the um, authoritarian states and you look into China with Mao, this is one of the moments in history that you would be studying. That's why I, I'm going to emphasize that. Make that your unit. Make that one of your units because it's just kind of puts everything into context and it serves as a refresher for Japan as well. Um, so they're trying to get rid of all the communists. By 28, the GMD moved forward to attack uh, Jiang Zhiuli, the old marshal. He was considered China's biggest warlord. Aside from being the biggest warlord, he also hated. He was hated because he cooperated with the Japanese who controlled the South Manchurian Railway. Um, so just to kind of kind of tie all of this together, we can see how big the hatred for communism is with uh, the with Jiang Jieshi. He was more than willing to to sabotage that relationship, that united front with the communists, which is going to bite him in the butt later on. You'll see um, because you are stronger in numbers and by kind of cutting ties with them and literally killing a lot of them, um, it makes the nationalist movement the party a whole lot weaker and unable to defend China from Japanese invasion, which we'll see later on. Um, Japanese viewed Jiang, uh, Jiang's expedition as a threat to to um, the Japanese interest in Manchuria. So Japan is making movements to kind of prevent these things from happening, right? Additionally, the Japanese doubted uh, Jiang's loyalty and preferred to work with his son, Jiang Xiuling, um, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, I'm so sorry, known as the young marshal, so the son, right? Japan's plan was to get rid of the old marshal by secretly killing him. They had hoped that by killing him, this would trigger uh, a sentiment of revenge within his military, his army, right? Oh my God, my boss was just killed. My warlord was just killed, right? My general was just killed. So we're going to go after and seek revenge and cause all of this chaos and mass slaughter, which would mean, oh my God, I am Japan. I am here to bring peace and kind of settle this whole situation down. And, you know, that was just an excuse, right? As, as a way to like, oh, we're going to bring peace, but really secretly they're just trying to go in to find an excuse to invade that region and control Manchuria. And the first part worked perfectly. They, they, I don't know how they did it. I have not looked into that, but you are welcome to look into that. Of They managed to assassinate him. He died, but his army was like, oh, oh, I guess. They didn't do anything. They didn't react. They didn't, they, this was the opportunity, this was their opportunity. Japan was going to, they had hope that this was going to lead to what they thought was going to be chaos in the region and then Japan would step in and be the heroes and then, you know, just stay there, right? That did not happen. So therefore, Japan had no opportunity to invade. To make things worse, young Marshall, who they felt was going to be the better alternative to work with, didn't do what they wanted him to do. He ends up coming to an agreement with Japan's uh, Jiang, Jiang, uh, Jiang Jieshi, the, the nationalist um, leader, and th this fully pushed Japan out of the loop and control of the region. Um, Japan will not try to regain control of Manchuria until 1931, which we'll see later on as well. And that is it.